I'm Dave Kassler, KE0OG, and welcome to Ask Dave, Episode 17. I'm here to answer your questions about amateur radio, particularly those of interest to those new to the hobby. Today's question comes from Jason, who asks for a video on power supplies. He wants to know the difference between linear and switching supplies. He would also like to find out whether the advertised voltages and currents are accurate. Does higher price equate to higher quality? Jason, thanks for your question. Let's delve into power supplies for amateur radio. No matter how good your radio is, it doesn't work without power. That power can come from many different sources, such as utility power, generator power, solar power, wind power, etc. I have several solar panels which charge batteries. The batteries, in turn, power my radio. Power comes in all sorts of ways, and each has its own peculiar characteristics. So there's often an intermediary function that converts or conditions the power to provide what our radios need. Most 100-watt HF radios, as well as VHF, UHF mobile radios these days, requires 13.8 volts DC input. Today's radios want a supply that stays at or around that voltage, regardless of the load the radio puts on it. And some loads, such as single sideband, are highly variable. Interestingly, if you look at the whole chain, the radio is simply a part of a system that converts power from a source to RF power that's radiated from our antennas. Let's touch on two common scenarios. In this one, a very common scenario for home stations, a commercial power supply converts the 120 volts AC, or 240 volts AC in many other countries, into 13.8 volts DC for the radio. There are many such power supplies available. Usually, for a 50 watt VHF mobile radio, we're looking at a 10 amp supply. And for a 100 watt HF radio, we're looking at a 20 amp supply. All supplies can surge beyond their ratings a bit for occasional peaks. You can get so-called linear supplies or switching supplies. The linear power supplies are blessedly quiet, not only acoustically, but also in terms of low noise on the power output. The switching power supplies are far smaller and lighter, as well as more efficient. The price to pay is often a small fan that makes a bit of noise, plus the switching mechanism occurs at frequencies that can create interference with the signal we want to hear. For this reason, we only want switching power supplies that are actually made with radio use in mind. Here's the second common scenario, a mobile installation. In this case, we take power directly from the vehicle's battery. VHF and UHF radios designed for mobile use come with rather long power leads to get all the way to the vehicle's battery. One issue is electrical noise on the power leads, which is why we want to go from the radio directly to the battery. Another issue is the rather variable DC voltage, which can be as low as 12 volts and as high as 15 or 16 volts. Mobile rigs are designed with this in mind. Let's look at the power supply challenge. Here the radio is represented as a load resistor in the pink box. Radios want a relatively constant input voltage, but the current going into a radio is highly variable. For example, a VHF mobile rig might want only one amp on receive, but suddenly wants 10 amps on transmit. And for HF, a single sideband transmission represents a highly variable load. This can be a real challenge to a power supply designer, because the load resistance is changing all the time. The design goal is that V sub C stay constant or nearly constant. Let's look at a real situation. 
Here I've connected this MFJ4225MV power supply to my Yesu FTDX3000. Note that you should always turn on the power supply before turning on the radio. I'm transmitting into a dummy load using single sideband. Note that when I don't talk, the current is quite low, just enough to operate the various processor circuits. But the load goes up dramatically on voice peaks, as shown in the left-hand meter, which measures current. But note the voltage meter on the right. It doesn't vary much. That's because the radio wants a fairly stiff supply voltage, meaning one that doesn't vary much with load. By the way, while we're here, let's take a look at the power supply's output voltage. This power supply has a variable voltage output, but a detent in the voltage knob is supposed to equate to 13.8 volts. Let's look at the voltmeter. Okay, it's not doing too badly. If you have this particular supply, be sure that the voltage knob stays where the detent is and protect it from getting bumped. I might note here that I don't see the reason for the variable voltage feature some commercial supplies have. The radios always want around 13.8 volts, and having an extra knob that varies the voltage doesn't really add any value, but it does add expense. By the way, always turn off the radio before turning off the power supply. Okay, let's switch to a PowerWorks SS30DV switching power supply. Hmm, the voltage reads rather higher than the promised 13.8 volts DC. It's within the allowed limits for the radio, so let's give it a try. The power supply compensates nicely for the higher current. In fact, it overcompensates just a bit, but it works fine. Also, the fan in this supply comes on only as needed. Now, let me tell you a dirty little secret. The power supply regulates the voltage at the output of the power supply, but between the power supply and the radio is the radio's power cord. Here's the power cord for my Yesu FTDX3000. Look at how long it is. In fact, it's nine feet long, and the fuses are way down here at the end. Okay, so what effect does that have on the power at the radio itself? First, let's look at the theory. The wire is 12 gauge, which is pretty thick, really. Now, according to the ARRL handbook, 12 gauge wire has a resistance of 1.588 ohms per thousand feet. We're dealing here with only nine feet, so that's 0 0.0143 ohms one way. Of course, we get that on the return leg too, so the total resistance in the wire is 0 0.029 ohms. That doesn't sound like much, but at 20 amps, that's about six tenths of a volt. So our 13.8 volts at the output of the power supply is actually 13.2 volts at the radio. Note that the connectors and fuses introduce their own resistance too. Let's look to see if this really happens. My radio has a handy power output on the back that can be used to power accessories, such as an antenna tuner. Let's just tap into the voltage here. Okay, you can see the reading here. Now, let me key down on CW at 100 watts output, again into the dummy load. Whoa, the voltage dropped over a volt. So in addition to our calculated ohmic losses, we also have loss in the connectors, fuses, and so on. But wait a minute. This is the power cord that came with the radio, right? So it's supposed to work just fine, right? Well, in fact, it does. Let's take a close look at this diagram that shows various allowable and non-allowable voltage variations. First of all, the horizontal blue line is in volts. At the left is 10 volts, 11, and so on, up to 16 volts. Now, 
A lead acid storage battery that's not being charged or discharged sits at 12 volts when 50% charged and 12.7 volts when fully charged. That's this range right here. But in my solar photovoltaic system, the battery is taken all the way up to 14.1 volts during charging. That's this line up here. So this is the range of voltage the photovoltaic system provides. Now, in an automobile, the voltage ranges from 12 volts when the engine is off up to about 15 or more volts when running. In fact, the system voltage variation in an automobile is quite large. This gives us a hint as to where the number 13.8 comes from in the first place. The so-called 12 volt system actually has a minimum voltage of 12 volts, but can go up quite a bit higher. By convention, devices are built for 13.8 volts with tolerances that cover the ordinary range of automotive voltages encountered. So, let's look at the spec for mobile radios. I have one each from Kenwood, Yesu, and ICOM, and they all have the same spec, 13.8 volts plus or minus 15%. That's actually a fairly wide range as shown by the top purple line. It essentially covers everything an automobile might do. There are some exceptions here, which are that during engine starting, the voltage can drop fairly low for a few seconds while the battery is used to crank the starter. That can pull the battery voltage down under 11.7 for a moment. This could cause unpredictable results in your mobile radio, which leads to the caution that you should turn off your mobile radio before stopping the engine and start your engine before turning your mobile radio on. Now, let's look at my Yesu FTDX 3000. Its spec is 13.8 volts plus or minus 10%. Clearly, it's not designed for an automotive environment. The low end of the spec is 12.4 volts, which makes battery use problematic. But with a plug-in power supply, it's fine. Even with the voltage drop I just demonstrated, it's fine. So, what happens when I run it on my photovoltaic system? The battery voltage is going to drop below the 12.4 limit during normal operations, particularly when under load. Let's look. Under key down conditions, the voltage drops down below 12 volts. I've noticed some unusual behavior in the radio, so I've purchased a gadget I'll show you later on. Jason wanted to know the difference between linear and switching power supplies. Let's look at each in turn. Both are available on the market, but the switching power supply is rapidly supplanting the linear. A linear power supply is so called because it is analog and uses what's called a pass transistor in the middle of its linear range. Here's a conceptual example. The radio is represented by the load resistor, which varies all the time, and all radio current also passes through the pass transistor. When there's not much current through the radio, such as during receive, there's not much current through the pass transistor. Note that the pass transistor, for reasons of convenience here, has a voltage difference of about 3 volts in this example. The control circuit is putting in very little base current. Remember that transistors are current-driven devices, and the amount of current from collector to emitter is determined by the amount of current from base to emitter. Let's say one amp is being used by the radio load, during receive for example, and hence that one amp has to pass through the pass transistor. To get the power dissipated by the pass transistor, we multiply voltage times current, or in this case, one amp times three volts, is three watts. Now, this is real heat and is dissipated by the pass transistor. Now, let's transmit. Our radio wants substantially more current, but still at 13.8 volts. 
The control circuit senses that the voltage across the load is drooping, so it causes the transistor to pass more current. Given that all the load current also passes through the pass transistor, that means 20 amps. We still have our 3 volt drop, so now the transistor is dissipating 60 watts. Yep, that's 60 watts of real heat that has to go somewhere. That transistor had better have a really big heat sink. So even though the linear power supply is conceptually simple, in fact it's quite inefficient. Oh, and the power transformer secondary has to handle the entire 20 amps, so that means thick wire, which makes for a big, expensive, and I might add heavy, transformer. The more modern approach is the switching power supply. The circuitry is far more complex than this conceptual diagram indicates, but as it turns out, no big transformer is needed. The secret is in noting that a transistor that isn't passing any current dissipates no heat. Also, a transistor that is to the wall biased for max current, in fact, has a very low voltage drop across it. This use of a transistor is called switching. It's either on or off. We don't use it in its linear range where it dissipates lots of heat but rather at the extreme ends of its range. Note that V in can be much higher than V out. In fact, it's often just rectified and filtered utility voltage. The control circuitry turns the transistor on and off at a very high rate, often around 50,000 times per second, or 50 kilohertz. Let's see how it works. The switch turns on. Current flows, which builds up the magnetic field in L1 and charges C1. This also provides current for the load. Then the switch opens. The inductor opposes changes in current flow and has a very nice circuit available through the load and D1 that allows current to continue to flow. Of course, the magnetic field is collapsing, so it can't keep this up forever. But our control circuitry notices that the load voltage is dropping, so it closes the switch and this repeats. Now, if the load draws quite a bit of current, Q1 needs to be closed longer each time to keep things running. When the load is low, Q1 is not closed for very long for each cycle. The length of the closing period, or in other words, the width of the pulse that closes the switching transistor, determines the amount of current that's available to the load. C1 is a filter to keep the ripple down to a minimum for the load. Now, a real switching power supply is far more complex than this, but that's the general principle. Now, we note that the switching frequency is commonly around 50 kilohertz, as I mentioned, so the inductor needs to keep the current flowing for only about 20 microseconds between each switch. In fact, a pretty small inductor can do that. And in fact, without that big, heavy transformer, switching power supplies are remarkably compact and less expensive. Now, here's the drawback. If the input and output lines are not carefully filtered, that 50 kilohertz square wave can show up as RFI in your radio. For this reason, get only those switching power supplies that are made especially for radio work. MFJ has several, as does PowerWorks. There are lots more on the market too. I suggest you look at the reviews on eham.net. Some of the newer Chinese models do not adequately filter the input and output. Even so, by using reputable amateur radio dealers, you can pick up an excellent switching power supply for under $100. Now, a couple gadgets have shown up on the market that can be called power supply adjuncts or power supply accessories. The first, shown here, consists essentially of a huge capacitor, actually several capacitors wired in parallel. 
The idea is that since the SSB load is so highly variable, use the big capacitor as the source of current for the peaks and let the input supply keep the capacitor charged during the time between the peaks. The normal duty cycle for single sideband is on the order of 40% when transmitting voice. So although the peak is 20 amps, the average is more like 8 amps. The idea was originally to use smaller supplies or the lower amperage power socket available in vehicles. But this can also be handy if you're working off one of the new inverting generators. The inverting generators adjust to meet the load, but the SSB load varies too fast for the generator to keep up with. But if you use a switching power supply, followed by this unit, it smooths the load quite a bit, making generator operation far more feasible and economical. The second gadget is quite interesting. As I mentioned earlier, a 12 volt battery's voltage is a little on the low side for modern HF rigs. This device has a little switching power supply that boosts the output voltage up to 13.8 volts. They advertise by saying that the actual battery voltage can droop to 11 volts, but that's a really bad thing to do to a battery. Lead acid batteries are 50% discharged when they are at 12 volts. And even for a deep cycle battery, that's a pounding. If the voltage does dip below 11 volts, it might be time to give the battery a rest and a recharge. I have one of these on order, which I may feature in a future Ask Dave. So, did I answer Jason's questions? We discussed the conceptual difference between a linear and switched power supply and pointed out that these days most people used switched power supplies marketed by reputable suppliers that are aimed at the radio market. We learned that the actual voltage output for the so-called 13.8 volt supplies can be rather different from each other. And Perfectly satisfactory power supplies are available from several manufacturers and a good supply adequate for a 100 watt HF radio can be found for under $100. Here's a picture of one of technology's early triumphs, the steam locomotive. If there's one thing that defines the 1800s, it's the railroad. The Durango and Silverton narrow gauge railroad now runs between Durango and Silverton in Colorado over a right of way that has been in place since the 1800s. Number 482 is one of the 1800s era steam locomotives which has been meticulously restored and is used today to pull the trains full of tourists. A bystander took this picture of me while I was on a motorcycle trip. Needless to say, the locomotive has lots more horsepower than my motorcycle, although I suspect my motorcycle can go faster. Be sure to subscribe to this channel to get notification of future videos. And remember that the Ask Day video series is for you. You can post questions as comments to this video or using the form at my website at ke0og.net slash ask hyphen Dave. I try to respond to every comment and question. If you'd like, there's a tip jar both on my YouTube channel page and on my website at ke0og.net. I thank you for your support and encouragement. Until next time, 73.